much. But just for those of you on the, those draft riots, uh, troops march right to the battlefield of Gettysburg, right to New York City to put them in draft riots. So it's, there is a link to that to our local history as well. Uh, Dr. Contrain, director of the Military History Institute, another director of this widespread Army Air and Education Center. Uh, glad to have you here tonight in the bad weather. It's a good turnout, and I think you'll be well rewarded for your effort with, uh, with Marina Penny in this presentation. I've known Marina for a number of years. More years probably than either of us will admit. Uh, Rita is a, an example of our Equal Opportunity Program here at AHEC and that she is a former Air Force officer. So we do let other services come in here now and then to talk. She's had a fascinating career. Um, she's currently an Associate Professor of History at Norwich University, where she teaches military and Russian history. She's a former Air Force Intelligence Officer. That is not an oxymoron. And uh, <laughs> served, uh, that's what people positive time. <laughs> served nine years as a Soviet analyst, working with the Red Flag Program on uh, Soviet fighter tactics. Uh, she's uh, worked for DIA, Alaskan Air Command. Uh, she, her publications include Wings, Women in War, Soviet Air Women in World War II Combat, and Amazon's The Fighter Pilots, a biographical dictionary of military women, as well as numerous journals and uh, chapters, journal articles and chapters and books. Now, most importantly for us in the military history community, she is the chair of the Department of Army uh, Historical Advisory Committee. She heads the group of historians who have the duty to advise the chief of staff of the Army and the secretary of the Army on the Army Historical Program. So she is well linked in with all the military history community. And she's also on the board of trustees for the Society of Military History on the academic side. So Rita brings a unique linkage between the civilian and the military half of the history profession. She's, done some, she's got some great background on this topic tonight, which she's going to talk about. Wings, Women in War, Soviet Women in Combat Aviation World War II, based on a lot of personal interviews with some of the women. Uh, she's a great scholar and a, a fine speaker, and I think you really enjoy the presentation. Rita. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming out. coming out tonight. I uh, apologize in advance. I'm just getting over walking pneumonia and I'm double mic'd. So if I have to cough, I try, I hope I don't break your eardrums, but take that as an opportunity to clear your own throats. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about some work I did for my master's thesis. And it was, uh, was fortunate enough to have this turned into a book called Wings, Women, and War. And uh, you probably know that women served in military roles in many times and places throughout history. But by, greatest, uh, by far the greatest number were in the Soviet Union. And in World War II in particular, there were about 800,000 women who served in the Red Army. About half of them were at the front. Uh, and they served in all branches of service, in everything from tanks to the infantry to the Air Force. But as a former Air Force officer, that's my particular interest. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Less than four months after the war began, there was formed in the Soviet Union a training group called Aviation Group Number 122, uh, created to train the personnel for three new active duty regiments. Those regiments included a fighter regiment, a dive bomber regiment, and a night bomber regiment. They were treated as regular military units in all regards except for the initial recruitment. So these units were never called women's regiments. Uh, they weren't treated any differently from any other unit. And in fact, two out of the three ended up with a fair number of male personnel, about a third male personnel, by the end of the war. They flew a combined total in these three particular regiments of 30,000 combat sorties. They produced 30 heroes of the Soviet Union. That's about the equivalent of our Medal of Honor, and at least two fighter aces. When Germany invaded the Soviet Union in June of 1941, the Soviet Air Force suffered terrible losses. Between that invasion and November, they lost more than 7,000 aircraft, mostly on the ground during the initial phases of Operation Barbarossa. So the aircraft were mostly destroyed on the ground. That meant that many pilots did survive the initial attacks. Uh, so lots of pilots survived. When these women were recruited, it wasn't a situation of desperation, the way that it's often perceived. In fact, right from the beginning of the war, tens of thousands of Soviet women volunteered for active duty. 
But there was no mobilization plan in place for the women, not even for the thousands of private pilots that had been trained during the 1930s. And in fact, many of these women pilots, when they volunteered, were at first told that they should volunteer for medical services if they wanted to serve the, the Soviet Union. They should be uh, nurses or instructor pilots. But uh, they weren't really happy with that if the women that knew how to fly wanted to get into combat flying. They had an advocate on their side, a woman named Marina Raskova. She was a commissioned Air Force officer who taught at the Zhukovsky Air Force Academy in Moscow, uh, was very famous during the 1930s for some record setting flights that she'd flown. Uh, one time she'd had to bail out of an aircraft in Siberia and spent 10 days alone in the taiga. She wrote a book about that that made her very popular with people. So she was quite well known. And in the first months of the war, many hundreds of people wrote to her, begging her to be their advocate, to help them get into the Air Force. So she decided to petition the government to create separate women's regiments. Now there were women already integrated into the Air Force, a, a small number. But Raskova believed that women would be better served, that they could develop their flying abilities and their command abilities better if there were segregated units that were created. Now, interestingly, her argument was not that these women would be freeing men for combat, because from the beginning, she saw these as combat regiments. She thought that women themselves should be able to fly. And in fact, the military uh, didn't really support this plan at first because at the time they had many more pilots than aircraft. So it's not quite the situation the way we normally perceive of things in the Soviet Union. Raskova did succeed and in October of 1941, the People's Commissariat of Defense issued this order. You don't have to read the whole thing, uh, but it says that three regiments, three regiments of women pilots and crews would be trained for combat duty. Now what's interesting about this is if you know what's happening in Moscow in October of 1941, this is the time of the panic when the Germans were practically on the doorstep of Moscow just before the Great Battle of Moscow began. And it was during that week when Raskova set up her recruiting stations in Moscow, called in the volunteers and personally interviewed everyone that went into these units and ended up with about a thousand people. Now another thing that's interesting is there were no physical exams and no medical exams for volunteers to this unit. Now that might seem strange to you because there were armorers, there were mechanics that were working with very heavy weights. They were changing propellers, they were re-equipping and re-arming aircraft in between sorties. But they seem to have just assumed that the women could handle the job. Uh, there had been heavy physical labor for most people in Russia for, for many years. They just didn't even bother to test the women who joined the units. As long as they were healthy and volunteers uh, and, and had some skills related to the job, they often could get into these units. There were also no restrictions on age, marital status, or motherhood. Most of the women who volunteered were young. Many of them were college students. But there were some who were married and had children. Raskova herself had an eight-year-old daughter. Uh, she left her in the care of her grandmother. So by October 17th, uh, as the, the German offensive against Moscow was reaching its peak, the entire group that had been recruited for Aviation Group 122 was transported by train to Engels. It's about 500 miles to the southeast of Moscow. Uh, there was a large aviation school located there. And they sent them in semi-heated freight cars uh, on trains, it took nine days to get there because they were frequently uh, shuttled off to sidings, practically no food. Uh, the journey in itself is, is quite a story. When they arrived at Ingalls, the first order that was given was that they would all get boy-style haircuts at the barber shop, and then their studies began in earnest. A flight training program that usually took three years on average was condensed into six months. <clears throat> Most of the women who arrived had no previous military training. The uniforms didn't fit well. In fact, there were no women's uniforms until 1943. So they were given men's uniforms right down to the underwear and the boots. You can imagine these things didn't fit very well. Their marching was something of a disgrace between the lack of training and the oversized boots. And some of these women had trouble adjusting to military life. I want to tell you one story that was related to me by Ina Pasportnikova, whose picture you just saw. Uh, she recalls that she first noticed this future fighter pilot, Lilia Litviak, during one of the, the roll calls. The women had just been issued winter uniforms, and at the morning roll call, Raskova commanded Litviak to step forward. Lily steps out of the formation, and everyone burst out laughing. 
because instead of the brown fur uniform collar, she had this white fluffy collar that she'd sewn onto her jacket. Raskova said, Litvyak, what do you have on your shoulders? A goatskin collar, Litvyak said. Why, doesn't it suit me? Passport Nikova says, the goatskin looks suspiciously like the stuff that was lining the new winter boots that they'd just been issued the day before. Raskova says, it suits you, but when did you do this? Litvyak said, during the night. Passport Nikova says, everyone burst out laughing again, but Raskova said sternly, well then, you're just gonna have to spend one more night without sleeping and sew back on the collar that's supposed to be on that uniform. Passport Nikova says, I looked at Litvyak then, small, delicate, and beautiful, still completely a little girl. How could she be a strong, courageous, tough-willed fighter pilot? Here she was making herself collars from boot linings. And what was she going to wear on her feet inside the boots? Blood was flowing and people were dying. And she was thinking about what suited her and didn't suit her? What sort of frivolity? I never imagined then that I would become the aircraft mechanic in the crew of Lydia Vladimirovna Litvyak, or Lilia as she preferred to be called, or that she would become the only woman in the world to have 15 enemy aircraft to her credit. And we'll talk a little bit more about her in a few minutes. So you can imagine that completing a crash course in how to fly or repair, navigate, and equip aircraft wasn't an easy thing, but imagine trying to do that through the heart of the Russian winter, because this training began in October and extended into the spring. And this was an especially severe winter. You've probably heard stories about how the German army suffered outside of Moscow. It's the same time frame when these women are flying in open cockpit aircraft. Uh, it was dangerous training. There were some weather-related training accidents. Four people were killed in, in one uh, night activity. There were other casualties during training, as is often the case during, during uh, any kind of aircraft training. We know of one suicide that occurred at the uh, training unit out of 1,000 people. Uh, but by April and May 1942, two of the squadrons were ready for active duty. The dive bomber regiment took a few months longer because they changed the aircraft that it was initially assigned and gave it a better, more modern aircraft. And all three of these units have very interesting histories. They're, they're all about, or written about in the book, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna talk about one tonight. Fighter uh, squadrons are my particular love because that's what I served with in the Air Force. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the fighter regiment and a few of the particular fighter pilots. The 586 began combat duty in April of 1942. Now this unit was assigned to the Air Defense Forces. This wasn't frontline air force, it was behind the lines flying uh, air patrols to protect fixed targets most of the time. So they were protecting uh, vital ground targets against enemy attacks, things like rail junctions, and they also provided fighter escorts for bombers and transports. They flew Yak series fighters and varying models throughout the war. And I know that map may be a little difficult to read in the back of the room, but it gives you some idea of the progression of this unit throughout the war, steadily westward as uh, the Red Army moved forward and they ended the war in Hungary and then in Vienna. The first commander of this unit was Major Tamara Kazarinova, uh, a military pilot from the 1930s who was known for her steely character. You get a hint of that maybe in this photo. But what's interesting is she only commanded the regiment for six months. And as far as we can tell, she never actually flew with the regiment. Now officially that was because she had an injury to one of her legs which she sustained in an air raid. But some of the veterans of the unit have told me that she just couldn't learn how to fly the aircraft. She couldn't learn how to fly Yak series fighters. Uh, the, the person who replaced her, Alexander Grydnev, said that he thinks she only got where she was because she was sponsored by a General Osipenko, who was commander of air defense aviation. Uh, Grydnev points out that both Kazarinova and Osipenko had received the Order of Lenin in 1937, a year in which such rewards were only given to people for exposure of enemies of the people. And so it was for her political connections rather than her flying ability that she got this command. Uh, Grydniev also says that Kazarinova was at odds with her two squadron commanders right from the start. Raisa Bilyayeva, who's shown on the left here, was commander of the first squadron, and Genya Prokhorova commanded the second squadron. They both had been on a very famous women's aerobatic team before the war, and the woman in the middle, Valeria Khomyakova, had also been on this team. She was a deputy squadron commander. 
So these were very experienced pilots. And they, along with several others, thought that Kazarinova should not be giving orders if she couldn't actually fly the aircraft that the unit was flying. Grinev says that things got so bad that these squadron commanders actually went to the division commander and asked that Kazarinova be removed from the regiment. So there was a great deal of animosity. This is something not written about, of course, in any of the official histories, uh, but only comes out in some, some unpublished papers and interviews. It's dirty laundry that they don't like to air. Soon afterwards, in the middle of September of 1942, Belyaeva's squadron was transferred down to Stalingrad. Only three of the eight pilots that went there ever returned to the 586, and I'm going to come back and talk about those pilots a little bit later on. <clears throat> uh, back at the 586, Valeria Konyakova became the first woman in the world to shoot down an enemy aircraft at night. This was September 24th, 1942. She destroyed a German bomber on her first night combat patrol. Less than two weeks later, Konyakova was mysteriously killed during a night flight. The cause of the accident has never been revealed publicly. In fact, the official records say that it was a combat casualty. But several of the veterans told me that Major Kazarinova was at fault. Khomikova had just returned from Moscow, a tiring three-day journey, uh, and Kazarinova immediately put her on night alert duty. She got the signal to launch, scrambled out to the aircraft, and crashed on takeoff, apparently due to both fatigue and because she hadn't given a chance for her night vision to adjust. Uh, Kazarinova was removed from command a few days later. Now, published sources all claim that it was because of her injury and poor health, but the veterans say she was finally being published or punished for her inability to command the, the regiment properly. But unfortunately, she got kicked upstairs. We've all seen this happen. So she ended up at Air Defense Headquarters on General Osipenko's staff. The second commander who was at the unit for the rest of the war was Major Alexander Gridnev. Now what's interesting is from the published sources, you'd hardly know he was there. They give a great deal of attention to Kazarinova, say almost nothing about Gridnev. But the unit did have a male commander for the majority of the war. And in fact, in the fall of 1942, all Soviet fighter regiments were increased from two regiments to three. A regiment, by the way, is about the size of a squadron uh, in, in our Air Force. So at that time, the 586 received a third regiment of male pilots. They had no female pilots on hand to augment the regiment. And like Gridnev, these pilots are almost invisible in the official histories. But if you go into the archival records, the names are there, their accomplishments are there. You can find some photos, uh, even though some of the women like to portray this as a mostly female regiment. There were uh, about 30% male pilots. After he took command, Grinev says that he quickly noticed that Zhenya Prokhorova was, in his words, the idol of all the regiment. They talked about her even more than they did Raskova. Prokhorova was an incredibly talented pilot, and she had two world records in gliders. <clears throat> she never had a chance to prove herself in combat, though. In December of 1942, uh, Grinev was ordered by General Osipenko to send Prokhorova on uh, a very strange escort mission. It was a flight that took place far behind the front. There had been no enemy aircraft reported in the area, and it was during a blizzard when no Germans were attempting to fly. Prokhorova was killed on this mission, uh, attempting a forced landing in the open steppe. Uh, I want to mention a, one noteworthy occurrence in, in the history of the 586 that took place a few months later, the spring of 1943. Sorry. Two pilots, Tamara Pamiatnik and Raisa Sunachevskaya, were scrambled from an alert standing. When they got to the target area, they discovered that there were 42 German bombers there. The women drove a wedge into the German formation, and they managed to scatter the bombers, forcing them to drop their bombs short of target. In the ensuing confusion, each woman shot down two German aircraft. Grinev says there was a British journalist at the front at that time, observing the event from, from the headquarters of the regiment. And he reported it to the King of England, <clears throat> who sent the women inscribed gold watches. Grinia says, our own people never even found the time to give them the gold star of the hero of the Soviet Union. But I believe this is one of the most distinguished victories of the entire war. They should hang two gold stars on each of them for this. By that time, uh, the spring of 1943, 
Only one of the pilots from that aerobatic team was still alive in the 586. Raisa Bilyayeva had returned from uh, Stalingrad and had two kills to her credit from that time. Grudnev says Bilyayeva was an exceptional person. It seemed that her body was not even like other bodies. She could withstand very high Gs. During training flights, she could beat any man. I never met any man like her. She could withstand so many Gs that when you were flying against her, she, you would black out trying to keep up with her. But he says that Kazarinova and Wysipinko were still waiting for an opportunity to get rid of Bilyayeva, and that presented itself during the summer of 1943. There were several suspicious incidents. Uh, she was a test flyer for aircraft that had been repaired. And in July 1943, she was killed in a crash while test flying a fighter. Grudnev believes that it had been repaired with defective parts. So Grudnev believes that Khomikova, Belyayeva, and Prokhorova were purposely assigned dangerous and unreasonable missions in order to hasten their death. He told me, I understood then, and so I understand now, that Kazarina and Osipenko had a plan to destroy them. Well, this is a conspiracy theory. Uh, could they really have been out to kill people like that? All I can tell you is that Grudnev's explanation fits the circumstances in a way that others don't, that many women told me privately they accept his explanation, but for perhaps obvious reasons, the Soviets would not allow this to be published. And in fact, Grudnev's memoirs, uh, when he first wrote them, his own son burned them because he was afraid it was politically dangerous, and then he completely rewrote the memoirs, but never could have them published in the Soviet Union. So what Grudnev thinks is that Osipenko despised the idea of separate women's regiments, that was his motivation, and Kazarinova was simply incompetent and vengeful. And after she lost command, she was bent to have revenge against the women that she saw as uh, having opposed her. <clears throat> Soviet women did fly in other regiments, in addition to the three that I've already mentioned. Uh, for example, this is Valentina Grizadubova. This was a friend of Raskova's. They'd flown together often. She commanded a partisan resupply unit, a transport unit during the war. Other women flew bombers. There were women in Sturmoviks. Uh, so there were scattered women in many other regiments, but uh, not uh, recorded routinely. It's very difficult to find the records on them because the Soviet uh, army simply didn't keep track of women as a separate category. Now I want to talk about the little dotted line here about the group that went down to Stalingrad in September of 1942. One of the squadrons, Bilyayeva's squadron, was sent from the 586 in the middle of September. This was the worst period of the fighting when the German offensive was at its height. And they were thrown into action with Air Force regiments that were poorly equipped, uh, poorly supplied, demoralized by heavy casualties to that point in the war. And the squadron of eight women pilots and their maintenance crews was then divided into two groups and sent to two different regiments to augment those pilots during the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, obviously, combat flying at that time was dangerous and very demanding, and the men didn't expect these women to do well at all. One new commander said, uh, this is combat, not a flying club. There are air battles every day. We're waiting for real pilots, and they send us a bunch of girls. So the reception wasn't exactly uh, pleasant. One group of four pilots was commanded by Bilyayeva. Uh, she's on the right here. And it included Lilia Litviak and Katya Budanova. What's interesting is they were sent to a regiment that did not fly Yak fighters. So their aircraft couldn't be properly maintained. They didn't have the parts that they needed for them. And so again, Grudinyev would explain that not as just an administrative error, but as part of an effort to endanger these women and get rid of them as quickly as possible. Lilia Litviak, though, quickly set the pace when she got to Stalingrad. On September 13th, three days after arriving there, she scored her first two victories. She shot down a bomber and an ME-109 fighter. Ina Pasportnikova, uh, Litviak's mechanic, remembers that the Messerschmitt pilot bailed out and was captured. He was a winner of the Iron Cross, brought back for interrogation, and he asked to meet the pilot who had managed to shoot him down. And when they brought Litviak in, perhaps you can imagine his reaction. He thought this was some kind of ridiculous joke. And he refused to believe that this was the person who had shot him down until she gave him a blow by blow of what the engagement had been like. Well, for any pilot to achieve two kills in one flight on her third day in combat is a pretty remarkable thing. It also made Litviak the first woman to shoot down an enemy aircraft in history. That fact has gone completely unrecognized. 
Konnikova back at the 586th shot down her bomber 10 days later and usually gets credit for being the first woman with a kill. But archival records make it quite clear that Litviak was first. Probably this went unnoticed because she was on temporary assignment to a regiment that had no stake in publicizing her achievement. Uh, the 586 didn't own her. She never went back to the 586. And in fact, they, some of them don't, don't like her for the fact that she wouldn't come back to that regiment. <clears throat> and in less than three weeks, they were transferred again to, to yet another temporary assignment. Uh, two months later, someone back at Air Defense Headquarters seems to have noticed that, oh, these women probably should go back to their original regiment. But when that order came down, Litvyak and Budanova and a couple of others appealed to stay at the front. They wanted to be with the active duty Air Force, where the real fighting was, and not go back to air defense. And so uh, their commanders refused to send them back, and they stayed at the front. One of the pilots has said that Budanova and Litvyak were both excellent uh, flyers, but very different in every other way. Budanova was tall. She kept her hair cut short. She was a cheerful, lively character, he says. And in her flight suit, she hardly stood out from the fellows. Beside Budanova, Litviak, who was only about five feet tall, seemed like a little girl. Litviak was thoughtful and quiet. And one pilot who knew her calls her a model of femininity and charm. She was pursued by several love-smitten pilots, as you can also probably imagine. Uh, but this, all, this same pilot says, she reacted extremely reservedly to the rapturous glances. She showed no preference to anyone. And this was especially impressive to us. Now, it seems that with Litviak, personal relationships took a back seat to the job at hand. It was wartime. She wanted to prove herself as a fighter pilot, and not just from ambition or patriotism, but she also wanted to redeem her family name. In 1937, her father had been arrested during the purges. He disappeared and was never seen again. Uh, Litviak never stopped believing in his innocence. And she seems to think that by achieving certain things in combat, she could uh, somehow reclaim the family's honor. So she was very determined not to, to tarnish her own repu re reputation and to become the best fighter pilot that she could. So this. This uh, idea that she could redeem her father, who had been declared an enemy of the people, certainly was a special incentive. Uh, but it also was a source of a deep fear for Litvyak and many other Soviet pilots, because more than anything else, she was afraid that she would go missing in action. Any Soviet soldier or pilot who disappeared was automatically suspected of desertion. Pilots, of course, often flew deep into enemy territory, or you might crash and your remains couldn't by, be identified. So she was determined that at any cost, if she was uh, dying, that she would find a way to land in friendly territory so that she wouldn't add to the suspicion that her family was under. In January 1943, Litviak and Budanova were transferred once again to the 73rd Guards Fighter Regiment. Uh, there's a lot written about this unit because there were many famous fighter pilots, including the squadron commander, Alexei Sol uh, uh, Mikhail, uh, Nikolai Boranov, I'm going to show you in a second, and squadron commander Alexei Salomatin. Uh, they had uh, both already achieved numerous kills. Boranov, uh, the commander of this unit, assigned Budanova to fly as his wingman, and Litvyak was assigned to fly with Salomatin. Boranov seems to have had no problems at all accepting the women in his regiment. Uh, Ina Pasportnikova said, Nikolai Boranov was a completely extraordinary person in all regards. He was wonderful as a person, as a commander, and as a friend. And the pilots called him Bacha, kind of like pop or dad. Uh, in his regiment, Litviak and Budanova got their chance to prove themselves in serious air combat. Uh, Litviak ended up with a total of 12 personal kills and three shared, while Budanova had six personal kills and four more shared kills. Litviak, though, was something of a rebel. She was definitely not a conformist, and she never tried to act like one of the guys. Uh, for example, she loved flowers. She had them painted on her aircraft. She kept pictures of flowers above her bed. And whenever possible, she put a little bouquet of fresh flowers inside the cockpit of her yak. Passport Nikova said, when men flew Lily's plane, sometimes they found one of her little bouquets. They would pick it up between their fingers and shout, what the hell is this? And then they would throw it out of the cockpit. Uh, but in early February 1943, Litviak made her first two kills with the 73rd Regiment. Later that month, she was assigned to join a group of pilots called the Free Hunters. These were pilots in any regiment uh, that were deemed skilled enough to go out on missions of their own, simply search and destroy, look for targets of opportunity. 
uh, and she became a flight commander and was promoted from sergeant to junior lieutenant. Early in her career, she adopted a, a showy habit, strictly forbidden, of buzzing the airfield whenever she achieved a kill. Uh, coming back to base after a successful mission, she'd break formation, perform high-speed victory rolls and low-altitude passes. And Passport Nikova said, after this uh, circus number in the air, Lilia would always ask me, did Bacha swear terribly? And if I said terribly, she would hang her head before walking over to him with her post-mission report. So she was careful to try and look contrite even after she had knowingly break, broken the rules. She was wounded on March 22, 1943, flying as a group of six fighters that were uh, attacking a dozen German bombers. She shot down one bomber when she felt a sharp pain in her leg. She found herself in a single-handed dogfight against six ME-109 fighters. And uh, in a kind of aerial game of chicken, she pushed the throttle forward, raced directly into the enemy formation. At the last minute, they veered off, and she shot down one of the fighters before the fight ended. Uh, she managed to land successfully in severe pain, losing a lot of blood from her leg. And she was afterwards sent back to Moscow for surgery and recovery. Uh, she got permission to recuperate at home uh, when the surgery was over because hospital beds are in pretty short supply, but she was restless and anxious, wanted to get back to the front, and within just a few days she talked her way onto a transport and got back to her regiment. She never saw her family again. Uh, but less than six weeks after being wounded, Livyak was back on the scoreboard. She made three kills in May and four more in July of 1943. But the month of May brought tragedy for Livyak as well as victory. On the 6th of May, Nikolai Baranov died when he attempted to bail out of his burning aircraft. Uh, his chute opened, but the pilots watched him plummet to his death with the burning parachute trailing behind him, uh, unable to do anything. <clears throat> uh, and in the same month, Litvyak suffered an even deeper loss. Before the eyes of the whole regiment, uh, Alexei Salomatin was conducting a training flight with a new pilot that had come into the unit and for unexplained reasons crashed and was killed. Uh, only two weeks earlier, he had been awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union Medal. You can see Litvyak here. If you look just to the right of the coffin, the very short person, uh, you can also see uh, Budanova next to her. There's a lot that's been written about a supposed romance going on between Salomatin and, and Litvyak. Passport Nikova says that everyone knew Salomatin was in love with her, but according to Litvyak's letters, she didn't realize that she loved him until after his death. Uh, there's a lot of nonsense written about this great romance they had flying together. In fact, uh, she, she had herself transferred away because she felt he was too distracting. But I have a copy of a letter that she wrote to her mother a few days after the funeral. And what she wrote there was, fate has snatched away my best friend, Yosha Salamatin. He was everyone's favorite, and he loved me very much. But at that time, he was not my ideal. And now it's terrible for me to endure, and I confide, Mamachka, that I valued this friendship only in the moment of his death. If he had remained alive, then surely this friendship would have become exceptionally beautiful and strong. You see, he was a fellow not to my taste, but his persistence and love for me compelled me to love him. And now it seems to me I will never again meet such a person. So by this point, uh, Baranov and Salamatin both had died. It seems that Livyak became increasingly daring, uh, some people might say reckless after that point. She was wounded again in July of 1943, but refused to even be sent to the hospital, said that the wounds simply weren't serious. But in July, she also lost her friend Katya Budanova. Uh, Budanova had uh, shot down two ME-109s, but was mortally wounded in the process. She managed to land her plane, but she was already dying when the local villagers pulled her out of her aircraft, and Litvyak was then uh, stunned once more and had lost all her dearest friends from the regiment. The very next day, Litvyak barely survived a fierce air battle and had to bail out of her burning aircraft. Uh, she made it back to her regiment, but her final flight took place 10 days later on August 1st, 1943, on the outskirts of the Battle of Kursk. On her fourth flight of the day, she participated in a mass air battle involving six Yak-1s against 12 German fighters and 30 bombers. She shot down two ME-109s that day and then was seen flying into the clouds, trailing smoke as she attempted to evade two more German fighters that were attacking her. They never found her aircraft. 
And so her first worst fear was realized. Her records were marked missing without a trace. Uh, all the accommodations that she was recommended for were never given because they couldn't find her body. Now, Passport Nico vowed that she would not rest until they did find the body. And some of you know, uh, some Russians know that it was very common in the Soviet Union for many decades after the war for people to go out in the summers, especially certain children's groups like Young Pioneers, and look for remains of people who had been killed in the war and try to identify the bodies. Uh, it took 40 years before they finally found Litvyak's body. And in May of 1990, Mikhail Gorbachev posthumously awarded her the uh, Medal of the Hero of the Soviet Union. The Soviet press uh, didn't treat these women uh, as great PR heroes. They did not get a great deal of publicity. In fact, they like to stress that even uh, during the rigors of the front, women could remain women. And in fact, by 1945, they were stressing new roles for women. Pravda, in March of 1945, noted that women in the Red Army have proved themselves as pilots and soldiers, but they don't forget that their primary duty to the Soviet state is that of motherhood. In July of 1945, uh, the president, Kalinin, spoke to a group uh, of demobilized women soldiers. And this is his final advice to them. Imagine this being said to, to male veterans. <clears throat> he said, allow me, as one grown wise with years, to say to you, do not give yourself airs in your future practical work. Do not talk about the services you rendered. Let others do it for you. That will be better. Well, I'd like to think that despite the efforts of people like Kalinin, uh, these people will not be forgotten and uh, that more uh, people will read about them and, and learn that women have been in combat. So I just want to mention one other thing. Uh, all the work I've told you about was part of my master's work. What I did for my PhD dissertation was then to go on and compare, <coughs> compare what had happened in the United States with what happened in Russia. Uh, very interesting, there's a lot of similarities in the two groups, about a thousand women in each case. Recruitment and training was very similar, but of course the missions were quite different. So the book I'm working on, uh, finally trying to turn my dissertation into a book this summer, is called Limited Skies, and it has that direct comparison of, of the United States and the Soviet Union. And that's it. Any questions? Your last statement led right into the entire disconnect I was feeling the whole time I was listening to you. I'm sitting here thinking, we never saw this in World War II with women, but yet everything I've ever heard, and I don't know that much, nowhere near what you know, about Soviet society says that women really weren't treated that well or aren't viewed that well. How in the world did this happen from a societal standpoint, and also, how did the men interact with these women, not just the individual, but, but I'm just, I'm for here. I'm, this, this is a total disconnect. Can you figure out what I'm trying to ask? You? Sure, yeah, those are great questions. Uh, it, there are some dichotomies in, in Soviet society. Uh, women had equal rights from 1917 on, in ways that they didn't in any other major country, as far as legal rights go. So on, in that regard, they actually were treated better. In cultural roles, it's true that the men still refused to do any cooking or childcare, so when women went to work, and before the war, 40% of all factory workers were women, so they had their Rosie the Riveter already, but Rosie was coming home and, and doing all the domestic chores as well. So the culture didn't change uh, along with the way things changed in the workplace. Uh, I've got a whole section on, on things like unit cohesion and what happened with men. Uh, what, what's really interesting is, is a phenomenon that we've seen often in, in sociology, is that the, the groups that were most opposed or had the most bad things to say about women, either soldiers or pilots or anything else, tended to be men that either never worked with any of those women or had a very small number of them in the unit. Men that flew often with the women or that were in these regiments almost always wrote, uh, very good things about them and treated them as, as colleagues and comrades. So a lot of it had to do with exposure. Uh, of course, you know, there are always individuals in, in any unit that can go one way or the other. There were some units, some women who felt that segregation was better. They just didn't want to have to deal with the men because there was always a learning curve in the beginning when it was new for women and men to fly together. 
Uh, but other women that were in the integrated regiments felt that that was better, that it was normal, the way that life should be. Well, that's a really good question, but the Soviets aren't alone in, in having that cultural mentality. You know, I dare say some of you have had husbands and friends that didn't necessarily pull their full weight domestically, even if you're working full time. So that, that's a good question, but it's a question more for sociologists maybe than a historian. <clears throat> Uh, this is the departure from your subject, but I really want to ask you, because you had research on this, on the Air Force problem and matters in the Soviet Union. Uh, we had B-17s operate out of a Russian base, and uh, did you ever come across information on that? Mm -hmm. How long did they stay there, and how many aircraft, and so forth? Uh, gosh, I don't have a lot of that information off the top of my head. I, I actually knew an American that was involved in that. Uh, he, he's gone now, uh, but at, and he, he met his wife there, but she was an American nurse that, that was at that base. Uh, but the, the Russian women pilots weren't involved there. Some of the French pilots in the Normandy Niemann squadron did know and fly with the women uh, at the same base, not in the same regiment, but from the same base. But most Americans never had any contact with the women pilots. No, they operated out of the base. Mm -hmm. Mark? Or oh, I guess, do we need a, a microphone? There's a question right here. Okay, sorry. Yes? Uh, in our Lend Lease program, we sent a lot of <clears throat> Bell Air Cobra P 39s over there. Did they ever fly those aircraft? No. I was wondering if you could describe in some kind of detail the various hoops you had to go through in order to get access to the pertinent archives as well as uh, how you tracked down some of these pilots and what you had to go through in order to interview them. Okay. <coughs> well, as you both know, Soviet archives are, are tricky and uh, when I went there in 93 right after the coup, there were still many problems, mostly to do with people's salaries not being paid and so people not showing up for work. Uh, with sometimes they're not having electricity, you know, just budgetary issues. Uh, very tricky about access. I, I worked through the Center of Military History in Moscow, but they wanted to kind of sequester me and just bring me documents and parcel things out to me, and I had to really battle with them uh, to, to get out and, and uh, get the documents. Um, the interviews I did in a completely different way. I had a friend that was working in the archives, and I had put together a little questionnaire saying that I was interested in this particular subject, and if anyone knew people had been involved in these units, I would like to get in contact with them. And one woman wrote back to me, uh, Polina Gelman, and through her I then got in touch with other people and set up a whole series of interviews. So all my interviews were done at people's homes, uh, privately, independently of uh, the, the Military History Institute, thank God, except for one or two things I did with some former generals through them. Uh, but that was so much better because I met people and their families, uh, even though it was in terrible neighborhoods and you know, pensioners just lived in, in really bad circumstances. Uh, but that was where I was able to get letters, copies of letters, and people were very free in letting me uh, copy, and often they had already made copies for me uh, to, to give me letters and memoirs and, and photographs and things like that. So uh, that's really where I got some of my best stuff. But then, of course, there were, there were published unit histories. Uh, I got copies of unpublished uh, unit histories for these particular regiments. They didn't have books about them, although the air armies they were in mentioned them. Uh, and then I, I got a number of archival documents that were daily logs, casualty lists, personnel lists, lists of awards, things like that. Yes? Oh, waiting for Mike. Do we have a mic here? Yes. Uh, Post-war, the, the, the women were almost all demobilized. Uh, I've got an article out about that in the Journal of Slavic Military Studies, which no one ever has heard of or read. Um, 
one of these David Glantz's publication, very small thing, but uh, yeah, I did a study of that actually. Uh, there were a few women that managed to stay in the Air Force for a few years, but you have to remember the Red Army had to go from 12 million down to three or four million. And it's kind of a last hired, first fired kind of thing. Plus lots of people really were sick of the war. Some of these uh, regiments, the, the Night Bomber Regiment never had a day off. I mean, it, it flew for the entire war, it was never taken out of the front lines. And a lot of those people wanted to go home. The regiments were, were just banded. So a few women managed to stay in for a few years at the end of the war. Most of them were immediately demobilized. Uh, of course, that's not unusual. In the United States, the WASP were demobilized in December of 1944. And in every country where women have ever fought, uh, the Yugoslav partisans in Israel, they were all sent home right after the war. So again, that's something that's cross-cultural. And it's interesting to figure out why both democracies and communist states treated women the same way. Hi, good evening. Hi. Thanks for sharing the story. It's a great story. Um, interesting enough, the, the transport during the United States at the same time, so it's, I, I never knew about the attack size. That's pretty neat. Um, what, did they get some, you said they were volunteers, but were they paid volunteers? And how did they make a living during that time? And then also, follow up to that is you say right after the war they were all demoed, but uh, further on, did they, they come up in the, in the forces like we have in, in America? Uh, let's see, what was the first question again? Paid. Paid. Uh, they had full military rank and pay equal to men. Equal? Yes. So women in combat were volunteers. There were women that were, uh, that were mobilized for particular jobs in air defense and communications and a few other fields. But the women in combat roles in fighters and in, in tanks and the army and some other things were all volunteers. But I mean, they were volunteers to join the service. Once in the service, they had full military rank. So they were not auxiliaries the way that they were in this country. Uh, so in that respect, they were treated completely equally to, to anyone else. Uh, they didn't attain the same rank as men because very few of them had been in service long enough uh, to attain that experience or, or promotion. Um, as far as, uh, let's see, demobilization after the war. Well, what's interesting is even during the war, they began to reinstitute segregated schools at the secondary level, and they began to uh, institute policies in military schools for cadets that only men could be entered. So they had already set a platform. Stalin was, was no particular friend to women. Uh, he got stricter on abortion laws and, and divorce laws and everything else. So even before the war ended, uh, those things were in place. So for a long time after the war, very, very few women could get into the service, primarily at the enlisted level. Very, very difficult for them to, to enter at the officer level until the 1990s when they went to an all-volunteer force and things became uh, a little bit different. But I, I don't... There's a, a woman in England working on that question, Jenny Mathers, writes about the Soviet Army today. Or I should say the Russian Army. I had a question. Um, I, 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 Do you want to wait for the mic? They're taping this session, so I think they want everyone on, on mic. Um, it's my understanding that uh, during the Russian Civil War, uh, even during the, the revolution, during the Kerensky period, that uh, there were all women uh, ground infantry units mm -hmm. or ground units. It, 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 was that the trigger in terms of introducing women units into the Soviet uh, forces? You know, I'm not sure if it's a trigger, but it's definitely a precedent. Uh, there's a, a good recent book called They Fought for the Motherland. I'm trying to think, Motherland Father. They Fought for the Motherland by Lori Stoff about the units in the First World War. So there were women in the Russian forces on a scattered basis before the February Revolution. And then after the Kerensky government took over, they did create uh, these units called uh, battalions of death. Actually, there were men's battalions of death as well. These were supposed to be kind of suicide units, not exactly suicide units, but units that would take on the most dangerous tasks to try to inspire other people that were flagging at that point uh, because there was a lot of um, you know, dissatisfaction in the Russian army by 1917. So there were a number of these women's battalions of death that were created, many volunteers, but the originator of that unit was, was uh, such a harsh taskmaster that she whittled down 2,000 volunteers to 300. Only one unit went into combat, uh, got one engagement, and then you had the October Revolution. Then during the Civil War, you had many women that did fight on the side of the Red Army in particular, not too many on the White Army, 
but in the Red Army, quite a few, and especially in the political commissar ranks. There were some famous women that were machine gunners, for example. Uh, so these things were in Russian history, and I, I'm not sure I would say common knowledge, but known to some people. It actually, it, you can go back to the Napoleonic Wars to find other examples as well. So there was a stronger history or better known history of women in combat in Russia than uh, many other countries. Uh, has there been, been an effort to translate your book into Russian and distribute it in Russia for their historical analysis? Is that me? Uh, no, not that I know of. Not unless they've done it without giving me copyright or royalties. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Dr. Frank, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. It's <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a tradition with perspectives of military history that uh, you know we execute a poster uh, for each of our, execute? our speakers. Yeah, execute is a good way to put the. <laughs> this is my uh, termination gift. Is yeah. that it? <laughs> Uh, but uh, this is a copy of the poster that, and, and now digital posters that we do, uh, both through Post and around different facilities in town. Uh, yours to take back with you or we'll send back with you. Uh, Thanks very much. Flight. But thank you again very much for your presentation. Very interesting.